We're recording now. Welcome, everybody. This is the bi weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have a presentation from Andrea Forketish um, about some very interesting work uh, she and a group of students um, have done on the cybersecurity of um, cyber physical systems in the new UMBC classroom building. ILSB interdisciplinary life sciences building. This work grew out of the uh, UMBC Ensure cybersecurity research course and was continued in January um, by a group of SFS students. I remind everybody that uh, we uh, offer uh, SFS and CYSP scholarships. We encourage uh, you to spread the word and for um, interested parties to apply. It's a great uh, deal if you want to work for government. You can find details on the cybersecurity website. Okay, uh, we're ready to go, Andrea. Great, thank you, Dr. Sherman. Um, so our research is titled Reconnaissance and Reverse Engineering, a case study of cyber physical systems in an academic building. Um, or, you know, another way of saying that is analyzing um, the ILSB smart building features. Um, so smart buildings have electronic infrastructure built in like access controls, um, heating and air conditioning, lighting, fire detections, or suppression. Um, and all of these systems are automated or controlled by a software. Um, to many building managers who are installing these um, types of sy systems, it just works. Um, they're mostly installed without much consideration to security. Um, so we'll start here by just going through an overview and then we will dig in. Um, so most of our research was focused on the reconnaissance part or the discovery. Um, we actually built replica systems or um, otherwise known as digital twins by procuring hardware, software, and firmware and set up our own little lab. Um, this had a bunch of benefits, um, mostly so that we didn't have to conduct any activities on the UMBC production network. Um, so if we made a mistake and something broke, it, we weren't affecting um, you know, the live building. Um, we discovered a great deal of how these systems worked, and we produced diagrams of how they interface and communicate with the network and where they're vulnerable. Um, so this is our research team um, during the, the fall semester. Um, I worked with um, Zach Amos, Leo Brown, Kevin Chen, Will DeStefan, myself, Brandon Hill, and Kathleen Corner. Um, wonderful people to work with. And we could not have done this project without the support of many people. Of course, um, Dr. Sherman, um, who spearheaded the project, but also um, do it. Um, Damian Doyle was a big help in getting us the resources we need and all of these other um, lovely people who had helped us um, achieve our goal. So our agenda here today, um, I'm gonna read through it, but it's this is the structure of, of the presentation and um, what I'll be going over in what order. So the introduction, the pictures here, um, I'm sure will be of no surprise to anyone on this call. It is the ILSB, um, the outside and the inside. It is the newest campus on building. It, it is the newest building on campus, my apologies. And it's also a smart building. Um, it has automation systems um, to control the HVAC, the lights, the key card access systems, cameras, and there's a lot more. Um, our project scope is focused on three areas. So the surveillance cameras, the lighting systems, and the access control system. These were chosen specifically because they contribute to the physical security of the building. Um, our goal of this research was to understand how the physical security systems interact with the larger UMBC network and get an understanding of the threat landscape UMBC and a typical university would face. Um, 
So before we begin, just just some um, just some thoughts here. Um, what is the value of project based learning? Um, because this is a really unique class. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, project based learning is, I think, significantly different from the traditional classroom experience. Um, we focused on one topic and really got to dig in deep to solve this problem. So this cybersecurity research class, or as Dr. Sherman uh, alluded to, the Ensure program provided students with the opportunity to conduct real world meaningful research. We were assigned a technical director who mentored us and basically set us up for success. Uh, projects are awarded by various national institutions like the NSA or the NIST. Um, there's others, but um, I won't name them all. Um, these projects require um, teamwork, a significant amount of collaboration between um, the school, your teachers, um, but also the organization you're doing research for, because ultimately they're the customer and they have to be happy with what um, your output is. Um, so these projects really give students the rare opportunity to gain workforce experience, research process experience, and also public speaking experience. Um, so with that, uh, we will go ahead and begin. Um, so what does cyber physical systems mean? Um, according to the National Science Foundation, a cyber physical system is any engineered system that are built or depend upon the seamless integration of computational and physical components. Um, so when, when we talk about cyber physical, um, it's really a, a physical device that interacts with, with a network. Um, so, you know, they're, they're really insecure um, traditionally because they weren't really, in, in the past, they weren't really designed to be interfaceable or internet reachable. These systems were, um, there's a variety of different reasons why they're insecure. Um, a couple of them are, they, are, they were designed before the internet or before security was really a focal point, um, or these systems were never intended to become a part of the compute system. Um, some systems are more modern and they were designed for connectivity, but a lot of these systems have limited capabilities, either um, memory space or, or what have you, to be able to have, um, to accept updates for, um, you know, firmware, for security, to patch vulnerabilities. A lot of these systems don't have enough um, memory or computing power to um, have real-time scanning performed on them. So a lot of times if you try to do a virus scan, they'll break, um, which is obviously isn't good because a lot of these systems need to be up 24 seven. So, um, you know, and, and it also depends on the vendor, um, how secure the software is built or how secure the firmware updates are. Um, there's a whole myriad of problems that, that you can download fake firmware and, and actually put malware in on your system. Um, and how can the situation be improved? Well, um, a lot of times, you know, as a cybersecurity practitioner myself, I always hear cyber is always doom and gloom. Well, there's always a good news story um, if you if you really dig and tease it out. So, you know, our good news story here is that security for cyber physical systems will improve as um, the topic area matures through research and through implementation. Um, so some good things that have happened in 2016, um, the NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, they created an IOT cybersecurity program charter, which is a bunch of stakeholders from different um, industries they come together to create um, security standards for Internet of Things. Um, there's also, um, in the manufacturing industry, they created their own member-supported group um, called Saimani, and they help 
to um, solve cybersecurity challenges within the manufacturing industry. Um, so this is previous work in notable cyber physical attacks. Uh, we use this to, to drive our research. Um, so the first one is um, Crotophil and Larson. They conducted a um, DEF CON talk in 2015. They did a, their presentation on cyber physical security of a chemical plant, which is wildly different from a university. Um, the notable contribution here is that they actually employed a um, chemical engineer who understands how the sensors work within the chemical plant. So what would set that, what would be outside the normal range of parameters? And they used that to um, really launch and, and create their attack that caused physical harm to this chemical plant. Um, of course, the, there's two cyber physical attacks that, um, well, there's more than two, but these are probably the most um, notable. Stuxnet, um, the first real cyber physical attack happened in 2010, where it was um, a worm that was transferred onto a USB device, and that USB device was then plugged in at an Iranian nuclear facility. Um, this worm basically exploited four different zero days at the time and ultimately caused around a 30 percent decrease in Iran's nuclear potency and then in uh more recently 2021 the colonial pipeline i'm sure everybody remembers how expensive gas was for a couple of weeks or how hard it was to get gas for a couple of weeks a ransomware attacked and shut down half of the east coast's fuel supply. It was later determined that it was a ransomware as a service attack where basically hackers can sell their malware um, to anyone who wants to buy it. So part of any risk assessment is determining who are the adversaries? Who are you defending against? Um, because without a threat model, you can't really understand which vulnerabilities are um, you should focus on. So for, in general, um, cybersecurity, there's about six categorizations of cyber threats. Um, so there's hacktivists, cyber criminals, insider threat, espionage, terrorism, and nation state actors. So UMBC, uh, as adversarial model, they de they defend against the first three. So hacktivists, they're groups with low funding, low skill. They usually exploit um, websites, website defacements, using scripts that someone else wrote. Um, they usually do this for um, political issues to make a statement or some kind of social gain. A cyber criminal will have um, a funding source and more skill because they're they're generally employed by either someone or um, self motivated to um, exfiltrate data on a corporate network and sell that data for the profit. It's where they get their money. Um, look at all the ransomware attacks that happen, and then insider threat, which is. Um, probably not so arguably the hardest threat to defend against. Um, you have two types of insiders. Um, they're, they're both people with network access, and they can either intentionally mishandle information or they're just careless. So we have, what is the problem? What did we set out to do and what could we not do? So the cyber physical systems, um, can be used as an access point to the network. Um, they can cause damage to the building or the components. Um, a realistic example for UMBC would be a denial of building access or um, unauthorized access and erasing camera footage to um, erase the evidence of any further crime. We had um, rules of engagement so um, 
those rules of engagement were pretty simple. They were set out by uh, Do It, which was everyone working on the system had to sign the NDA. Uh, we were only allowed to work on the designated systems. We could only access the system to understand how it works. We could not cause damage or any disruption. Um, do not disseminate information and also don't be reckless. Make sure you ask permission before you do anything. Makes sense. Um, so our methodology here was really um, two steps, um, reconnaissance and then moving on to reverse engineering. Reconnaissance is the preliminary surveying for information. So we were lucky, Do It gave us insider privileges to um, restricted areas and restricted parts of the network. So we were able to get into networking closets and get packet captures of these systems so we could do the reverse engineering of them. Um, so we use reverse engineering to get the raw communications, uh, mostly using Nmap scans. We scan devices of interest. Uh, once we had a good network map, um, we, we, we downloaded firmware that we found online and we used Binwalk and Ghidra um, to reverse engineer those. To reverse engineer the card readers, um, we used a serial tap. Now I'll talk about the cyber physical systems. Um, these are the pictures of the cyber physical systems that um, we analyzed. So on the left, you see the picture of the ceiling inside ILSB, which has the camera surveillance system that we analyzed and the lighting system. And then on the right is the Linnell card reader. Um, most doors on campus have these Linnell card readers. You use your campus ID, you swipe it, you're either authorized to go into the room or the building or you're not. Uh, we actually established the digital twin of the camera and the card reader um, so we could work on those offline. Um, the lighting system controls the lighting. Um, you can set a schedule or change the color of the lights. So these are our findings, and um, this is the fun part, right? So this is the camera system and how it's set up. Um, there's actually two types of cameras. Um, there's what they call PTZ cameras, which is like point, tilt, zoom. And then um, some areas on campus have 360 cameras where you get a full, a full view. So there's two types of cameras on campus. And you'll, you'll kind of see here, there's um, the access cameras have um, on-premise um, storage. So everything's hosted at UMBC. And then they're upgrading to a Meraki style camera, which um, puts the system into the cloud. So this diagram just kind of outlines the interfaces and how you could exploit the camera system. Um, so on the the left side here, you can see that the ILSB has a public VLAN. Um, a, a do it employee or a student or just someone in the building that happens to plug into um, a network port can get in there, find the camera server and actually access it. Um, so that's what that's showing you. you from here you can view camera video and you can also upgrade. Um, the firmware and configure the cameras however you need to. So this is the attack that we did on the camera system. Um, us being the insider threat here on the left hand side. Um, the attack diagram shows how um, you don't need any UMBC affiliation. You just have to be in the building to access the VLAN. Um, so the attack uses a CGI exploit using an authenticated local command. 
Um, we injected arbitrary commands, um, and at a certain point, um, you're able to delete files by sending commands in a get query string uh, by concatenating a bash script. Um, the attacker can also um, use any arbitrary commands to, to pretty much do whatever you wanted to do to a camera. Um, you could delete footage, you could add fake footage, um, you, the sky's the limit. Um, so what should really happen? Um, a client-side JavaScript should prevent the bad characters. Um, it should validate the user input, um, but it, it doesn't. Um, so this is the card access reader interface diagram. This is how it should, this is how it interfaces with the network. And then we'll show the attack diagram like um, the camera system. So on the left, you have, you know, the, the do it employee or um, us posing as a, a reconnaissance analyst. Um, you can plug in your laptop again and go into the on guard um, server admin panel um, and look at all of the different um, components in, in the card reader. Um, also, card readers are publicly available on pretty much every door on campus. Um, they, they're screwed onto the wall. They come off fairly easy, um, so you can pop it off the wall and, and see what it's all about. Um, there's also um, the database that has all of the rules, um, so each student where they are allowed to go where they're not allowed to go, faculty, admin, ev everybody who has an ID has a um, entry in the database. So a little more about the Linnell card reader before we get into the attacks. Um, the ILSB uses the Linnell um, 2010W and the Linnell 2020W. These are rebranded Mercury MR5-10 readers. They use an RJ11 interface in between the reader and the Linnell um, 1320 jack. Um, it uses a serial connection to provide power, the LED lights, and also a two-wire data zero-data one or a two-wire data clock. The Linnell 1320 uses the YGAN protocol, data one dash data zero, or the clock data to communicate. It also connects to six relays, uh, which are toggled to unlock the doors. The 1320 connects to a primary um, ISC or, or intelligent system control via an RS-485 serial interface. Um, and the master database uses a window SQL server on, on with on guard software. Um, so that kind of sets the stage for the attack. Um, so this is the attack here. Um, there's actually multiple vulnerabilities that, that can be exploited here. Um, you have an insider threat that could connect to the VLAN. Um, you can either do a heart bleed attack or a CGI attack. Um, the Linnell software uses a depreciated version of TLS, um, so you can just heart bleed to get in, or um, the CGI exploits like in the camera system um, to exploit this, the web server. Uh, once you're in, you can um, you can connect to the server. You can send compromised firmware to the machines. You can modify. Um, you can capture the the card data and and modify it. You can grant full access by by doing a, a replay attack. Um, so this is the more um, interesting part. This is the PCAP from the Cisco switch um, span port. The switch. Uh, relays the data from the Linnell controller to the on-guard server. 
um, if you're not familiar with this data flow, you, you might think that this is gibberish, but this is actually unencrypted data. Um, and it allows for a replay attack. Um, this picture is a picture of a valid card swipe. Um, so version five of the OnGuard software uses encryption over TCP natively. Um, so this wouldn't be an issue. Um, for that version of the OnGuard um, data. Um, so here, you know, data can be sent to or from the primary controller um, in plain text also. So this means that the Linnell um, controller, the, the 2220, can be knocked offline by a byte storming the OnGuard port. And in this slide, we have oscilloscope readings um, so let me explain what this is. Uh, this is communication between the Linnell 2220 and the Linnell 2010W after a valid card swipe. Um, the signals correspond to data and clock protocol. The blue signals that you see um, are a 911.9 microsecond clock signal, which computes to about 11 baud rate. Um, this actually determines what the bits should be. So a one for the rising edge of the red signal, um, you can see here um, with the clock high and then zero when the red signal is low, we can start pulling the bits out from this. Um, so using the oscilloscope, you can um, then go to the next step, which is with the payload, the oscilloscope ratings and the clock rate from the oscilloscope ratings, you can capture and replay the card swipes to gain unauthorized access to the different labs and ILSB. Um, this attack is pretty simple as the card reader is physically accessible. Um, a cheap embedded device um, shown here, the Raspberry Pi Pico, or you could use um, Arduino Nano. Um, you basically just insert it into the back of the card swipe. So um, if you look at the picture at the bottom of the laptop, there's a um, card swipe that is face down. So you can see the, um, the, the serial connection attached to the board. And that little Raspberry Pico Pi, you just kind of pop it in there somewhere and basically let it sniff out of valid card swipes. Once you capture valid card swipes, you're able to launch the replay attack. So here's where we started um, analyzing the firmware um, and we used Binwalk for this. Um, so here's the, the pictures of, of the process. Um, so the firmware is scarily available publicly online from the Linnell website. And this is the full binary. Um, the binary in a best case scenario is updated with the software, um, not downloaded directly from the site. So the firmware that we were able to download um, was an older version um, it was compressed, but it wasn't encrypted. Um, so we used binwalk here, and you can um, follow along here. Um, we used some commands to dump out the firmware in verbose mode. Um, from there, you could mount it from the file system to gain access to the full firmware. Um, so we found a lot of vulnerabilities here. Um, we cracked the password in um, less than a second. And um, the root password, um, it's a, I mentioned earlier that these boards are rebranded Mercury boards. The password was Mercury. Um, <laughs> very, uh, very insecure. Um, also the web interface here, um, it doesn't need authentication 
to get into. Um, so because it doesn't, you don't need to be an authenticated user, you can launch a distributed denial of service attack. You could also complete an unauthentic, unauthenticated buffer overflow, uh, which is Heartbleed uh, because it uses the, the depreciated TLS version 1.1. Um, and you can also do a command injection. Um, the, the post request of the web interface can also be used to obtain the session key so you can do um, authenticated attacks as well. Um, so this is the lighting system. Um, the lighting system is a Pharos lighting system. It uses a lighting playback controller. The lights themselves use a, um, a dip switch and interface with an RS-485 serial connection that can configure them to change the colors and, of course, set the schedule. Um, and this is what this looks like. It's a it's a closed segregated system. So this really um, isn't internet connected. There was no um, web GUI to to play around with. It, it all was a um, console, which is shown here in a restricted area, um, using serial cables. So after we we did some reconnaissance. We determined that this system was likely not um, installed properly by the vendor. None of the colors could change. You couldn't set a schedule. Um, behind this console was a um, removable memory, um, and we found in there that's where where the schedules live and and a host of other information and. Even though we tried to set a schedule and, and, and put the memory card back in, it, it didn't do anything. So uh, we came to the conclusion that um, UMBC should, should um, invite the vendor back to um, get this installed properly um, and make sure that the dip switches within the lights in the ceilings are also configured properly so you can change the lights within the building. Um, so we have a bunch of recommendations for, um, do it and the, and the building management. Um, the first is the, the Linnell access, um, make sure that encryption for all the data in transit is on and configured properly. Um, that way. The data can't be intercepted and a valid card swipe cannot be um, captured and replayed. Um, also, by segmenting the control system and applying access control lists um, on the, on the um, UMBC VLAN, that way somebody, and you don't even need to be a student, um, doesn't just walk into the building and um, have the ability to plug in and get some type of access to the UMBC network, um, like we were able to log on to the, to the OnGuard site from just being in the building. Um, so applying regular access controls, which I believe was already done, um, that, that access point is taken away. Um, additionally, um, apply a heartbeat in the card readers themselves that are attached to the door. Um, this heartbeat, you can, um, it basically reports back every like couple of seconds or every second that can be configurable to a server. And if the card reader stops reporting this heartbeat back, it's reported as a potential security violation because that means it went offline. Um, so either the connection was severed or it was tampered with. Um, when you go to put in that Pico Pi, you have to take it off the wall and connect the Pico Pi to the wires. And while you can get very good at it and do it very fast, if you have this heartbeat um, 
basically going back every second. Um, there's no way you'd be able to tamper and be able to skim off valid card swipes without notifying somebody. Um, we had recommendations for the SFS study to continue studying the Linnell card swipe reader um, to um, analyze hardware vulnerabilities, firmware vulnerabilities, and the protocol vulnerabilities. It does, um, the Linnell card swipe uses the Wigan protocol, which there are uh, multiple studies showing how that um, protocol is vulnerable um, and that could use some attention. Um, so on that same topic of, of future work, um, the Linnell card reader, um, again, without the, without the digital twin operational, um, it's difficult to perform, um, activities on the card reader without, um, going to the ILSB and, and doing it on the production network. Um, so there's, there's definitely opportunity to, um, further the analysis of the hardware. Um, the Meraki camera firmware, um, firmware analysis um, is tedious and time consuming. And um, with our group analyzing three systems, um, we just ran out of time in the semester to fully um, go through the Meraki firmware. Um, we focused on the, on the Linnell card reader because we found the firmware online and easy, and it was unencrypted. Um, the Meraki camera seemed a little bit more secure, so um, you know we we focused on the low hanging fruit. And um, the Meraki camera firmware is a um, potential area for future work. Um, and of course, there's also increased the scope for cyber physical systems within the building. We did the the access control and the surveillance and the lighting. Um, you could always analyze a different cyber physical system, like the fire suppression um, system would be another interesting um, system to, to analyze because that could really cause a lot of disruption, um, especially putting all of our work together. You could create a fire alarm, which causes panic and then lock the doors, um, not a position you really wanna be in. Um, so there's definitely some future work that, that could be um, explored. So in conclusion, um, what did we contribute? Um, we laid the framework for conducting cyber physical security research within an academic building. Um, we uncovered that being in an open campus where anyone can just walk in um, without needing to check into a guard or um, getting, in, you know, in a, in a traditional um, corporate environment, if you want to visit, you need to have a badge or, or um, an escort, depending on the level of security. And in a university that, that doesn't happen, um, even if you don't belong there, you can kind of walk on campus and um, get into space while um, classes are going because none of the doors are locked when, when classes are going on. Um, so, you know, we provided the understanding of how these um, physical, control, physical controls and physical systems interface with the network our research yielded in finding vulnerabilities and we provided mitigations to the school. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. So what do you recommend in, in terms of the general state of embedded system security? What do you recommend to the manufacturers? Like what is, if I'm manufacturing these devices, what is the number one thing I should be focusing on? Um, well, stop putting easy root passwords on, on your, on your hardware. Um, for one, um, how some of my focus is, um, ensuring that firmware updates to these physical devices is secure. Um, so, you know, a, a you know, look, 
we could take Linnell, for example, say a hacker defaces their website. Um, the hacker could then upload um, fake firmware updates with the hash file that matches the malware. Um, anyone that's, um, you know, you could, anyone who needs to update their firmware could easily go to their website, say, hey, everything looks good. Let me download it and install it and, and unknowingly install malware. So we need, um, we need to figure out how to get integrity mechanisms um, within software updates. So whether that be um, pushing out software updates or, you know, making sure that people don't get it from, from their website. And if you do have to get it from your website, making sure that um, that website is um, locked down very good um, using NIST standards. I would, I like to plug NIST. Um, but using good cyber hygiene, cyber best practices, and kick out the low-hanging fruit um, to make it very difficult and basically not worth a hacker's time to try to um, infiltrate and, and, and replace with malware. Okay, thank you. Can you comment on... Um, why the situation tends to be so bad? Like, what are the factors that bring about the situation where third party software tends to be very poor? And what recommendations would you have for improving that landscape? Oh, gosh. Third, third party software has always been an area of, of, I would call it cyber terribleness. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a hard problem to solve because it you can't just go to your vendor and, and say you need to do better. Um, they'll probably kick you to the curb and be like, "We do what we do." Um, yeah, I. It's a hard. It's a complex. It's a complicated problem to solve because they they need to be able to solve it and. Un Unfortunately, many times institutions only only want to um, improve their cyber situation when an attack happens, and you see it all the time. You know, like whatever. Um, you know, say Cisco had a an an exploit. You know, all of a sudden they have a bunch of job openings. Um, you know, or or bank fails a. A regulatory check. They have a bunch of job openings for for the regulatory. So I, I think, you know, it, it's customers need to demand that security is better, um, but also the vendor needs to needs to make sure that um, you know things are up to snuff, and and it's hard to convince them to spend the money. Um, it's a difficult problem. Um, Damien, I uh, see so you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to chime in on, on that one a little bit. I, I, I think it's it's also about how how the systems are typically approved and designed. Uh, they're not they're not generally, even though they may be managed in some respects by the IT organizations, they're not often going through them. So. Um, when you think about a lot of facilities, uh, these systems are quoted into building building design and um so they're they're actually done a lot of times by architecture firms and and other groups and until it becomes economically beneficial for these vendors you know if they can't if they can't use security as a selling point if that's not going to resonate with their their customers whether it be the design firms or the facilities groups or these other areas if if it doesn't sort of pay them to get better um, if it's just the, oh, well, we got hacked and, and then adjustment, I think it becomes hard to get them to take it seriously because they're looking at, they're looking at, well, you know, how do I respond to the, the RFP or how do I respond to this um, and do that? And if, until it's sort of set at that very beginning, I think it becomes a challenge to get them to really take it seriously. Yeah, um, and just to kind of piggyback on that comment and, and um, I work with, Navy systems and a lot of these cyber physical systems were 
built in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And they literally, um, it was before cyber was even a, a whisper. So now we're, we're tasked with trying to provide these systems with funding to care about security. And a lot of them are just like, we're a 60 year old system that has, you know, one really old Linux box. You can't even get it. You can't even pay us to care about it. So it, it's, it's, it's an honest challenge that, um, you know, I haven't figured out yet. And I'm, and I'm sure a lot of people are, are struggling to figure out how to get these vendors to care. Deanna, you had a comment. Yes, um, my question was, how do you, are the universities funded for this? Like, if, even if you have recommendations, where does, where does that come from to, you know, act on your recommendations? Because companies like a bank, you know, can find it. Can universities act on that? Maybe that's a question for Damien. Are, are you asking where do universities find the funding resources to act on recommendations to improve security? Can they do that as um, nimbly as a, a company can or a national lab like where I work? Uh, maybe it depends, um, depends on the severity. I mean, I think, um, I, I think just as, as Andrea was saying, it, some of these systems are are older and they're in place and there's some really significant costs to upgrade them so i do think it it becomes more of a challenge because we you know we can't go into debt to do them um so if if we need more money we would have to make a we have to make a case to the university the university may have to make a case to the state um so it, it can be it can be more challenging then yeah, I and um, part of that also goes back to um, the risk profile or the adversarial model that I that I outlined um, earlier in the presentation. You have to understand who you're defending against. So a school like UMBC, while in, they're not the U.S. government, they're not going to really worry about a nation state actor because there's a good chance that if the, a nation state actor like Russia or Iran wanted to target UMBC for whatever reason, it, it doesn't matter how many controls you have, they're, they'll, they will get in because they're a nation state actor. They have time, they have the money, they have everything. Um, and UMBC doesn't have that much funding to defend against them. And plus, what assets does UMBC have that they're working on that they would need to actually defend against a nation state actor. Um, so, so part of that is understanding your, your, your risk, your adversarial model and your risk thro and threat profile, um, because really you use that to guide your risk assessment process where you'd outline. So we, we outlined all those risks, right? And we, we detailed out mitigations and we, we kind of put them in a table in our, in our report. So, um, do it can go in and then um, if they want to use that table, they can expand it to say, what's the level of effort here? What do we gain from um, doing this mitigation? How much time, how many people do we need? Uh, what does it take to mitigate this um, particular vulnerability? And if they calculate it out and they say, this would take someone 10 minutes and it's a configuration, of course you're gonna do it. But if there's a threat or a vulnerability on your system that um, requires deployment of a new technology, that's 10 people and a year, well, you might try to do other things to make it harder to um, get to that system before you deploy a new technology. What are your um, plans for continuing this research this spring? Um, well, I'm 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 doing a couple of things. Um, so, you know, uh, earlier in, in January, I supported the SFS students. Um, 
They, they analyzed a lot of these vulnerabilities further for, um, they had a week. Um, so they mostly, most of the progress was in the firmware analysis, um, but a, a week is not a whole lot of time to get set up. So there's definitely um, opportunities to um, explore this more. Um, and I'm also uh, working under uh, Dr. Banerjee to um, look at manufacturing vulnerabilities. So he set up a cyber range, um, which is a, a digital twin of a manufacturing plant. Um, so we are actually researching to see what type of security mechanisms can be deployed on the embedded systems. Um, so what kind of scanning can we do before the system breaks? Um, and what type of cyber can we build around these manufacturing systems to make sure that they are secure? So things like firmware updates um, won't bring in malware. Are there any more questions? Yes, Samantha. Samantha, are you there? <laughs> we can't hear you. I think you're muted, Samantha. Can you hear me? Yes. There we go. Sorry about that. It changed my microphone on me. Um, listening to both you and Damien talk about some of the issues that we seem to be having with manufacturers and firmware updates and just getting people to care about building security into some of these systems. This seems to be kind of a community problem. I mean, if we could get more on the public side, you know, looking at security and understanding how big of an issue this is, then potentially we could get more on the manufacturing side in correcting this. So what are some of the things that maybe we can start doing as students to start putting, to start changing opinions? Is, is there anything that we can start doing at this point in time? Um. Well, as students, you know, I, I so from my experience as a as a cyber practitioner, I, I went from um, um, a, an, a SOC analyst to um, a consultant to now somebody who who works um, and helps the government. And one thing has always stayed consistent, and that's to um, my mantra would would always be when somebody asked me, can I do this? It's yes, but securely. Um, so it, it's really, you know, cyber always always gets a bad rap. It's always doom and gloom, doom and gloom. Um, you, you never let me do anything um, or you make my life really hard um, or everything's the firewalls problem. I can't get out because of the firewall, right? Like, and I'm, I'm sure if anybody here works IT, you can, you can laugh about that a little bit because you, you hear it all the time. Um, the main... The main sticking point here, what I'm getting at, is to be friendly, open, and honest to people. Maintaining connections and having conversations with people about why this is important is, is really the only way. And it's a difficult thing to do because people get fatigue. Um, analysts get alert fatigue. Um, Directors get cyber, cyber, bad, bad, bad fatigue because all you hear is all these bad news stories. This is vulnerable. That's vulnerable. It's like, well, what is there anything that's connected to the Internet that is a good news story? It's like, well, not really, because the adversary has the upper hand and always had since the inception of the Internet. And it's it's really just uh, maintaining communication um, in a way that um, you can be forward, that promotes discussion, 
and avoids that sort of burnout. Okay, so patient education in part of of people that have less IT knowledge and be careful not to make sure that we're we're only focusing on the bad points is what I'm hearing on this. Yeah, I, I think those are all really good suggestions. I mean, I, I, I talk about a couple things and IT security tends to be one of more. It's sort of like um, sort of like having having a, your roof replaced. You know, if you if you have a house and your roof, if it's you don't want your roof to be leaking, but it's not the most exciting thing you can do. Um, for your house in that respect, right? Nobody, nobody like goes each day and goes, man, I'm so happy my roof isn't leaking every day. But boy, you don't want it to happen. So it's really difficult. It's challenging to talk about it in a way that that isn't sort of that. Um, well, the what if, the what if, and we try to talk about security being part of everyone's job. Um, that's one of the, the the things we're we're trying to educate around the university on is that security isn't just an IT thing. It is it is really part of what everybody needs to be thinking about just as they live and work in a digital world. Um, these are things to be aware of. There's a lot of things as a community we all think are part of sort of shared responsibilities. And I think, unfortunately, cybersecurity has kind of gotten labeled in like to a, a corner where it's like, oh, well, they're going to deal with it. And, and it really, it's about wherever you, you know, whatever opportunity you have to try to talk about it being part of everyone's work. And I think if we can start to change that message, then it's less about IT saying you need to do this to be secure, and it's more of just this is a part of X or Y or Z. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. A very interesting project and talk. In uh, two weeks, we'll be back when uh, PhD student Ennis Goloshevsky will talk about cryptographic binding and his analysis of uh, parts of the FIDO um, protocol. Thank you so much. Thank you.